but we really want to make sure that everybody is able to attend tonight. So please come and worship with us. We are going to go just deeper with our relationships with the Lord. Bring a chair. Make sure you bring your, your lawn chairs, your soccer chairs, your beach chairs, whatever you want to call it. The kind that you bring and you put in your car so you can bring it to an event. Bring that chair so that you will have a place to sit. You can even bring a blanket for your family to sit on. There'll be grass. Um, I'm going to bring, it's just like you're going to worship in the park, but with a beautiful barn. It's on the DeMarco's house. Thank you. Yeah. Joey. It's at Joey's parents' house. So we're so thankful for them allowing us to be there tonight. But it's at 530. Don't be late. You don't want to miss it. We are going to just go deeper with Jesus in prayer and worship. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else I was supposed to say? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's GCC Live is not happening in July. Is that what you want me to say? Okay. It's not happening in July. We'll talk to the parents at that effect. Okay, I'm going to pray again. I know, we're, we're just doing so great. Who is feel, who is so thankful for the fans today? I'm thankful for the fans. If you need to move to a closer seat by a fan, feel free. There's seats up here. There's a fan back there. If you feel like, man, I see that fan and I want to get closer to it, please feel free. We'll all close our eyes while you move. Okay? Dear Jesus, we thank you for uh, this time again, Lord. I pray that you would just uh, steady and ready our hearts for... Um, just the words that you have prepared for us to hear this morning. We thank you so much for the gift of hearing um, your children worship you, God, in this space. And I pray that they will also just receive the words that they are um, receiving here um, behind me and in front of us. Lord, I pray that you would um, speak to their hearts, God, make your truth come alive to them, that they will forever be changed. And um, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Good morning, GCC. Once again, it's my joy and honor to be with you guys this morning. Uh, yes, the fans. I mean, it might just be in my mind, um, like when we got those little teeny tiny heaters a few months ago, right? I mean, it was just like, I feel like it's warming it up, but maybe not. Anyways, it just feels good. So um, I know uh, Janae already mentioned it, but we are so excited about our night of worship uh, planned for this evening. If you want to go deeper uh, with Jesus, I mean, if you really want to go deeper in, you know, into his heart, for you and just worship him. You don't want to miss our gathering for prayer and worship. It'll be right down the street. It's just literally a couple turns right down the street. And it'll be a time where we come together as his people with just one goal. Just one goal is to honor and glorify Christ. That's our goal. Like we don't want, like he is enough, amen? Jesus is enough. And so when we're going to come, we're just going to come before him. And so John 4, 23, Jesus said to the woman at the well, he said, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father is seeking. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And so I know for some of us, when we talk about worshiping in spirit, people get a little freaked out. Like, wait a second, what are we talking about here? You know, like there is a way to receive from the Holy Spirit. And so it's very practical, it's very biblical in coming to Jesus coming before his throne, giving him our hearts and our minds, preparing ourselves for him. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. It's a, it's a time where we're just going to lean in and go all in. And it's also a time where people will come and they can hear from the Lord for their life. I know so many times I've talked to people over and over, countless times over the years, and people will say things like, I just don't know how to receive from the Lord. I just don't know how to hear from God. Did you know that there is a way, fact positive, that you can hear and know the will of God? It's in Romans chapter 12. It says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. We're going to talk about this a little bit more tonight. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He said, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So do you want to know his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life? Offer yourselves to him. No longer conform. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. I really highly encourage you. You might be on the fence like, I don't know, it might freak me out. You need to come. Well, I don't know. I've got some stuff on my schedule. Clear it. <laughs> it's that kind of a night where we just need to come together as the body of Christ and really go all in seeking his face. So last week we took a break in our Ephesians series to honor our fathers and also encourage one another to live on mission and in order to leave a godly legacy behind for our children's children. We looked at the life of Joshua, 
for that. Something that our children can look back on and remember that their parents and grandparents, that crazy neighbor down the street, man, they loved Jesus. And we also heard from Matt Crampton. Wasn't that awesome? Can we get up for, for Matt Crampton one more time? Matt is awesome. You heard his testimony of what it looks like to walk out your faith in a very practical way. And so if you missed that or any of our, our, our messages through the Ephesian series, you can get it on YouTube at the GCCIE. Uh, but the last time we were in Ephesians, we were continuing in chapter 4, looking at the practical ways we can live out our faith in Jesus. It's very practical, right? These are very practical ways that we can live out our faith for Jesus. In the beginning of chapter 4, Paul said that we need to walk in a manner that is worthy of Jesus. To live our lives in such a way that would be worthy of the calling that Jesus laid before us. But he also furthered that thought in chapter 4, verse 17. This is what we covered last time. By saying this, he said, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Walk or live worthy and no longer live as the non-believing world does. Sounds great. How do we do that? Well, in chapters 4 through 6, Paul doesn't just tell us go and then leave us without further instruction. He gives us very practical things. And so that's what we're going to look at by jumping back into chapter 4, starting at verse 25. But before we do that, we pray one more time and ask God for some revelation. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing. We glorify you. We come before you. We lay down our lives, God. We surrender. Surrender our hearts and minds to you this morning. We pray that in every way, Lord, that you would open our ears, that we may hear your words. We may hear your voice. You would open our minds to understand your word in a deeper way and open our hearts, Lord, to accept, fully accept and surrender to your will that we would follow you all the days of our lives. Would you give us wisdom and insight into your word this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. Let's jump in. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 25. We're going to read this through, and then we're going to go back in. So it says, Therefore, each of, you must, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. In these short eight verses, there's only eight verses here, we go into seven different commands for Christian living. These aren't really suggestions, right? Paul never says, well, listen, if you want, I guess if you are thinking about it and you, you want, he says, this is who we are. It's what a new life in Christ actually looks like. When we are saved, we are also transformed, and he begins in us a new work that actually makes us new, right? So he doesn't just start a new work in us. He makes us new. There will still be some lingering effects and issues in our lives from our past and our sin nature, nature for sure, but that's normal. However, that doesn't give us an excuse to live like the world does any longer. <clears throat> We've been brought out of those ways, those thoughts, those desires, thanks to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so we need to begin to walk it out. I was screaming in Lake Havasu this last week. I was screaming. It was crazy. The kids were like fighting on a, a lily pad. It was incredible. It was so much fun. And I was like kind of emceeing it. Here we go. I can't even do it because I'm going to mess up my voice. But hold on. messed it up. <clears throat> so, this is how we begin to walk it out. Walk it out, right? It's incredible to see how easily Paul can go from lofty theological talk about two humanities 
about the Christ we have learned and the new creation we've experienced to the nitty gritty, down and dirty, right? Like living life of Christian behavior. He gives us seven commands here. He says, tell the truth, control our anger, honesty at work, kindness of speech, live to please the spirit of God, getting rid of certain traits and putting on others. All very practical, all very applicable to our lives today. But before we come to these seven things, we need to notice that there are three features that are common to all of them. First, in this section of scripture, all of these practical commands of Christian living concern our relationships. This is concerning our relationships and how we live. This is what it should look like as we live out our faith with those around us. You see, holiness is not a mystical condition experienced in relation to God, but separate from people, right? It's, it's found out, it can, be, it, it can be found out in our relationships. And secondly, in, it, in each example that Paul gives a negative action, he balances it by a corresponding positive command. So he says it's not enough to put off these old rags. We have to put on the new things. And thirdly, in each of these, a reason for the command is given or implied. And it's all theological. It's the teachings of Jesus, right? Of, of his people. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's go back to verse 25. And our first practical command, number one, is do not lie, speak the truth. Ephesians 4.25. It says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. The word for falsehood in the Greek is pseudos, which is where we get our word pseudonym, pseudonym, right? Or something that is false, like a fake name. It's a lie. We need each of us to put off falsehood. It's another way of saying we need to stop lying and start telling the truth, right? For, for we are all members, Paul says, of one body. Paul was addressing us as the the body of Christ, those who believe, Christians, we need to stop lying and start telling the truth. I think it's important that he distinguishes those in the body and not just anyone and everyone who might read this. I think it's for two reasons. One is we can't expect or even hold accountable those outside the faith of Jesus, can we? What morality do they have? What, what clear line do they have? We can't hold them accountable. We can't expect someone outside of Christ to hold to the standards found only in him. You see, we get all bruised up and twisted when someone lies to us and we're standing there like, I just can't believe it. I just can't believe they lied to me about this thing, right? Or whatever it is under the sun. If they don't know Christ, their hearts haven't been enlightened. They haven't stepped out of darkness and into the light of God. There hasn't been transformation in them. That's number one why Paul addressed the church specifically and not those outside of it. The second reason I think that he addresses us is to say, we expect lies from the ungodly, right? But what about us? What's our excuse? I think what lies and falsehood do is it diminishes our voice. What Paul is saying is it diminishes your voice. I've always said that there are two types of people that are most difficult to trust in this life. A liar and a thief, right? Paul addresses both of them here in these short eight verses. If you steal or lie, it's very hard to be trusted, isn't it? And if people can't trust you, then when you speak, there isn't a lot of weight or impact those words have, is there? No, there's not. Why is that an issue with the body of Christ? We're supposed to be bringing the good news, the best news, the life-changing news of Jesus to those around us. And if I'm known as a liar, then when I try to share to unbelievers about Jesus, they have no way to know if it's true or not. It diminishes our ability to have an impact with people God has placed around us. However, the opposite is also true. When we speak the truth, no matter how hard or embarrassing or painful it might be, what people do is they don't, they don't shrink back from that, do they? People tend to lean in and trust that, don't they? It's almost like the more real and raw it is, people lean in even more. And that's, that's why it's awesome to share the good, the bad, and the ugly with your life, because it's real. People want real. It shows, it, shows, it shows in our sin that we are not perfect, but the love and grace of Jesus is, right? 
That's why we share the truth with people. We don't hide it. We don't hold it back. We tell the truth. Then when you share with people about Jesus and what he's done in your life, they believe it because it's trustworthy, right? They know this person tells the truth. Besides, all of that, lies are actually the language of Satan. Did you know that? He's, he's the liar. He's the chief liar, right? So what relationship should we as believers have with him? We shouldn't. The second command that Paul makes clear for us is number two, is controlling anger. It's Ephesians 4.26. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your, while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Again, we see the, the contrast between the negative action and the way to live opposite of that with a positive command. Paul said, in your anger, do not sin. You notice here, he doesn't say, don't get angry. He says, when you do, don't sin. For many of us, I think this is a common misconception in the faith that we associate anger with sin immediately. And so we make ourselves docile to the point of being pushovers. We think anger is a sin. And so we say, I can't get angry. And what you have are a bunch of people running around, not getting angry about the world around us. And we become docile to the point of being lethargic and unuseful, right? Like we need to get, we need to get angry about some things. Well, abo abortions, abortions are terrible, but I can't be mad about it because I'm a Christian. So we just say, oh, poor babies, right? Or people are killing each other in the streets because of a flag. Did you guys see that recently? It was, a, it was an Argentine, not an Argentinian flag, a Cuban flag. And some people were just in a parade. They got ripped out of their car, car and shot in the street. We're like, oh, well, that's sad. Like, that's sad. I can't get angry because I'm a Christian. Listen, being a Christian does not mean that we don't get angry. Jesus got angry. <laughs> he got some, he got, some would say, indignant, right? Like, if Jesus were here today and he went into Washington, it would be incredible. <laughs> it would be awesome. But if he did that and started flipping over the podiums of the senators, people would say, man, this guy's unhinged, right? But that's exactly what he did in the temple in Jerusalem. He saw these, these charlatans selling sacrifices to make a profit, and he went in flipping the tables of the money changers and whipping them out of the courtyard. But he never sinned. How can that be? He was angry, responded, but still didn't sin. Paul was saying, be angry, but don't sin. Then he tells us how. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. He was saying, deal with it today. Today. Deal with it today. The sooner we can deal with the, with the point of anger, that thing which made us angry, the better off we're going to be. You see, when anger is allowed to sit in the heart for too long, it becomes in us a root of bitterness. And we know from Scripture that a root of bitterness defiles many. Romans 12 says that. When anger sits in the head and in the heart, it becomes just like an exposed piece of steel in water, right? Imagine that. If you had a clear cup of water and you just dipped a bolt in it, you took it out right away. Is the water still good? The water's still good, isn't it? You can still drink it. It's still healthy. It gives you nutrients. It will, it will still provide for your body. But what happens if you take that same cup and that same bowl and you stick it in there and let it sit for days or weeks or months? or even years. Can you come back to that water and drink it at that point? It poisons it, doesn't it? That's exactly what happens in the life of believers when they don't deal with sin, when they don't deal with anger immediately, right? It's allowed to sit in your heart and in your mind and it poisons us. And so if, you, if, if you're dealing with anger today, Paul's saying, deal with it. Don't let your sun go down on your anger. If that means you need to address something someone did, then do it, right? But love them through it. Don't sin. If your spouse made you mad, man, I know that this is for a lot of us, right? Like this is for Janae and I, you know, we, we, we still argue, we still fight, but it's always based on something that, well, you know, it's six weeks ago, you said this. And it's like, oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember what I had for dinner last night. So I'm sorry if I said that, you know, like, or we do this to each other, don't we? And it's so, all he's saying is like, when we do this, it gives the devil a foothold in our when you allow it to sit, it gives him a foothold to sit.
sink down those roots of bitterness and it, and it takes hold. And that takes years sometimes to repair the damage. Point number three, he says, honest work, honest work. This is verse 28 of Ephesians 4. He says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they, might, that they may have something to share with those in need. Again, I think this goes along with lying. If you are a known thief, it's hard for anyone to trust the things that you say. It becomes a trust issue, and when you're not trustworthy, it leads to a diminished impact for the kingdom. But listen, I want you guys to hear this clearly. That doesn't mean if you've ever lied, cheated, or stolen something, that your testimony or your story is ruined. Okay? Doesn't mean that. No. In fact, there's a rebuilding that we can do, and Paul touches on that here briefly. He says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. If you've stolen, stop stealing, right? It's pretty obvious. But if there wasn't a precedent, I guess there would not be a need for the, this to be in there, right? Like there was... There were some signs that we saw recently, and it's like, are you kidding me? Somebody had to put that as a sign? Well, if somebody hadn't have done it, they hadn't put the sign. So Paul was putting in here, he's saying, listen, stop stealing and start working. Do something useful so that you can share with those in need. How can we, we, we rebuild trust after we've broken it? We can work hard in something that is actually useful and then give back to those in need. It's an honest work. I know that that, that that doesn't match our culture or our political structure, but the truth is still the truth. If you've ever broken trust by doing any of these things, it's not the end of your walk and your effectiveness for Christ. It takes time and diligence on your part, but in the end, it ultimately shows to transform life. People will see the change and the new you, and that will outlive, outshine, and outperform the old you when you stay the course with Jesus. It will outshine. We have to walk it out with Jesus. That means that we also need to stop using the age-old excuse that it's it's just my nature. It's just my nature. I can't help it. It's just my nature. No, it's not. Not anymore, right? If that's still your nature, then buddy, you need to go get straight with Jesus, right? Like, I've heard for many, many years, people in my circle say, well, it's how I was raised just part of who I am, just how I was raised, it's my life experience, they just make me that way. That might be true apart from Jesus, but in him, in him we are new creations. The Bible says the old is gone and the new is here. You might have been a thief or a liar, but now it's time to stop and follow Jesus. Follow him. Point number four, Paul's fourth command in our new life in Christ is this, is wholesome talk wholesome talk. Verse 29. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for, for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The apostle turns from the use of our hands to now the use of our mouths. Speech is actually a wonderful gift from God. It's one of the uh, human capacities which reflect our likeness to him. For God speaks, and like him, we also speak. Speech distinguishes us from the animal creation, doesn't it? Cows moo, dogs bark, right? Donkeys bray, pigs grunt, lions roar, monkeys squeal, birds sing, but humans do what? We speak. But no one knows what the fox says. <laughs> but no one does know what the fox says. Thank you, my son. That was really good. That was good. Next time I'm going to go over my message with you so I can add that in. Paul was saying, so let no evil talk come out of your mouths. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. That's the definition of unwholesome. Anything that doesn't build up. Paul says unwholesome here is sapros, a word used of rotten trees and rotten fruit. When applied to rotten talk, whether this is dishonest or unkind or vulgar, we may be sure that in some way our speech can hurt the hearers, right? Our speech can hurt people. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... Is that true? 
No, that's not true, right? We've been told that for years since we were children. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. I mean, words have the power of life and death, the Bible says, right? Like, check this out in Proverbs 18.21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its what? Fruit. Paul's talking about sopros, which is rotten fruit, right? What is coming out of our mouths? Think about that. The power of life and death are in the words of our mouth. God has given us the ability to share life or to sow death. Jesus taught the great significance of our speech. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in our hearts? What's coming out of our hearts? That we will have to give an account, he says. We will have to give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word we've spoken. And that terrifies me. Like, that should really, like, keep us awake at night. Like, we will have to give an account on the Day of Judgment for every idle word we have spoken. Or in James 3, it says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. By hell. If we are truly a new creation of God, we should undoubtedly develop new standards of conversation. Instead of hurting people with our words, we should want to use them to help to encourage, to cheer, to comfort, and spur them on. Now, sometimes we mess this up. I'll give you a perfect example. This weekend, we were in Havasu. We were with the Stampers. We were, on a, we were going to, to launch our, our crafts, right, our, our, our water crafts. And so Chris Stamper pulled over, and I knew that I was in the middle of the road, but I gave a lot of extra room. I have all the kids in the back of my truck, and so I gave a lot of extra room. They're going to jump off and get on Stamper's boat, and then we're going to go launch our, our stuff, and then we're going to go on the lake. So I pull over. And this guy pulls up next to me, and he starts honking and flipping us off, and he's screaming in the car, right? So I stick my arm out the window like, hey, you're a real classic, buddy! <laughs> that's all I could think of in the moment, right? Like, that's, and that's what came out, you know? It's like, hey, Jesus loves you. I didn't say that. I just said, you're a real class act. Like, we mess this up sometimes, right? And we're going to have to give an account. But I have myself often been challenged by the contrasting speech of the wise man and the foolish man in Proverbs 12, 18. It says, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Or even Proverbs 16, 24, and I love this. It says, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. I've been challenged by this. The question I'm often asking myself is, when I speak, am I building people up? Am I building up my kids, or am I tearing them down? Am I, am I building up my wife, or am I leading her astray? You see, we need to think before we speak, don't we? A lot of the times. That's why God gave us two ears and only one mouth, so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. But that's not always the case, is it? No. So there's this acronym. I don't know where I came from originally, but it's been in my heart and in my head for years and years and years. And I wanted to share it with you. It's, it's we need to think before we speak. And this is good for your kids, right? This is something that we help teach our kids. Think. Is it thoughtful? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Or is it kind? If it's not, if it's not thoughtful, helpful, inspiring, necessary, or kind, is it worth it at all to say? Because God says our time is short. And we need to make the most of every opportunity, don't we? Before the days are evil. So are we thinking before we speak? We need to think before we speak. Number five, command number five for a new life in Christ. Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's not immediately clear why Paul now introduces the Holy Spirit into this mix. When he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But the apostle was constantly aware that behind the actions of human beings, our invisible personalities are present and active. He just warned us not to give an opportunity or a foothold to the devil, right? But now he urges us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's evident from this that the Holy Spirit is fully personal with us. 
He's fully personal with us, isn't he? It's not some far off God that we can't offend. He is within us. He is personal in us. Because the word for grieve is lipeo, which means to cause sorrow and pain and distress. Well, only persons can feel these things, right? The Spirit of God is personal with us. But what grieves him? Well, because he's the Holy Spirit, he's always grieved by unholiness, isn't he? And since he's the one spirit, disunity in the body of Christ will also cause him to grieve. In fact, anything incompatible with the purity or unity of the church is incompatible with the purity or unity in him. Therefore, it hurts him. So we, we also notice here that the reference to being sealed with the Spirit for the day of redemption. Now, there's a twofold sealing that happens in the life of believers. One, at the moment that we believe, right? As we saw in Ephesians 1, we've been sealed by the Spirit of God, right? He seals us, he saves us, and he continues to save us. He reconciles us and continues to reconcile us. He saved us and continues to save us, right? So he sealed us at the moment that we became believers, and again, he will seal us for all eternity when we go to be with him, right? So that's either when he comes or we die, and we go to be with him, there is a sealing that happens, and that's what Paul was talking about. But it's, in, it's the in-between those two moments that matter most. It's the in-between. The moment that we receive Christ and the moment that we go to be with him forever, it's the in-between that Paul is talking about. Between the day we first believe and the day we go to be with him forever, in between those two monumental moments, we are to grow in Christ-likeness and to take care not to grieve the Holy Spirit in that time. For the Holy Spirit is a sensitive spirit. He hates sin. He hates discord. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now for the last two commands on Christ-like living, we move into familiar territory here. Just a couple verses prior to 31 and 32 in chapter 4, verse 22 to 23, which we covered a couple weeks ago, Paul said, You were taught with, your, with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this same thought and process has to be applied to these next two verses in points number six and seven. So we have to get rid of our old identity and again continually put on our new life. Let's look at it. Point number six, we need to get rid of, get rid of these things. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Here there's a series of six unpleasant attitudes and actions which we are to put away from us entirely. Bitterness, which we talked about a little bit ago, that root that poisons our heart and our minds. We need to put off rage and anger, which is commonly linked in the scriptures. When you find rage and anger, they're usually linked together, right? And it's just like when you get angry to the point of rage, does anything good come out in that moment? Never anything good comes out in that moment, right? And so he's saying, get rid of rage and anger. <clears throat> it's just a sudden outburst of, of passionate flesh. Just, uh, and then it says, be angry, but don't sin, as Paul says. But we also need to put off brawling, which here means shouting. Also used to describe screaming and shouting ugly things. It's kind of what I did to the guy, you know what I mean? Like he drove by, flipped me off. I was like, what was that, buddy? Like, okay, oh, I was dumb. And we need to put off slander. We're talking trash, trash to one another and all malice, which is just that, that ugliness that's within us. This is old life stuff. This is old life stuff. Time to put these things off. It doesn't matter your life circumstances, your childhood, your upbringing, your background, your experience. It's time to walk in maturity, Paul is saying. Time to begin the process of surrender to the Lord and allow him full reign access to your life. Every part of it. And we have to allow him by his spirit to begin the transformation process in us. When you start down the road of old living and you hear that, that tinge of the spirit convicting your heart, it's stop. It means stop. 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 He doesn't hate us. He's not mad at us. He hates sin. Right? He's saying when we have that tinge and we have that conviction in our hearts, it's a, it's, a, it's a warning sign. It's a stop sign. God's like, okay, stop. Turn around. 
No, no, it's not who you are anymore. That's, you, you, remember, you're my son now. Remember, you're redeemed. You're holy. You're a holy nation. I want you to turn around. Stop. Turn around. So it's time. We need to put off these sinful things, put these things to death, the Bible says. They do nothing but cause division and hardship. But like the rest of our commands in direction, Paul doesn't just leave us with the negative, right? Our last point, number seven, he says this. We need to put on. He says, instead of all that, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We need to be kind to one another. The word here is Christos. And because of the obvious likeness with the name of Christ, it means to be like him. It's being Christ-like to one another is kindness. Did you know that? Kindness is Christ-like behavior. Kindness and compassion are two traits that are most easily and obviously linked to Jesus. When we sin and we mess up, we, we come to him and experience what? Kindness and compassion, don't we? I don't know about you, but I've never come to the throne of God in full surrender, in full, uh, uh, where, I'm, where I'm just confess, full confession, and God's like, no, nope, not today. Mm -mm, I'm mad. No, you need to give me some time to cool down first, okay, buddy? You need to back up. Just back up. I don't want to look at you right now. Like, that's never been the case with Christ. When you come to him, how does he receive us? Every single time. Kindness and compassion. Paul was saying as his disciples, his followers, his image bearers, we carry the same spirit to those around us as well. When we are living in him, connected to him, then he brings about the change starting within us. He transforms us. And apart from him, this is impossible to do. We can look at this list as do's and don'ts, and you can try your hardest to do it. It was called the law. How many people could live by the law? No one, right? No one. That's why they had to have sacrifices to cover the sins of the people who couldn't live by the law. All of these things, these aren't do's and don'ts. This isn't behavior modification. He's saying, when you live in me, I will begin to do these things in you. I will begin to transform you. I will begin to bring the fruit, not the bad fruit, right? I will be begin to bring good fruit, living fruit, Holy Spirit fruit from your life. And this is what it looks like. But that doesn't mean that we just get to sit back also and just say, okay, God's going to do it. I'm just going to continue living. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. Paul says, no, no, we shouldn't continue to sin. By no means, right? We are those who have died to sin, and now we are alive in Christ. We need to walk in this. And then he says this, forgiving each other. Just as in God, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Forgiveness is one of the best known and well-established markers, long establishing Christ followers from the rest of the world. It means that we release others of their sins against us. And this is a big one for us, I feel like, this morning. Most of the time, long-term anger and bitterness that we talked about a little earlier, they come from a heart of unforgiveness. When you have long-term anger and bitterness in your heart, Nine times out of ten, it's because you have unforgiveness in your heart for that person. But what does the Bible say? If we're unwilling to forgive, then Jesus said his Father in heaven won't forgive us. Did you know that? It's very clear. Matthew 6, 14, it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins... Your Father will not forgive your sins. This is heavy. This is hard sometimes, isn't it? I don't know about you, but this is hard. What is forgiveness? What is it? Does it mean that it makes what someone did okay? Is that what forgiveness is? No. It doesn't make it okay, does it? Does it release them of the judgment or consequence of what they did? No, that's not what forgiveness is, right? For a lot of us, it has nothing to do with them and what they deserve, but forgiveness releases you. It releases you. Well, no, no, i got to forgive them. I have to release them. But what forgiveness actually does is it releases you. When we forgive, we are releasing the judgment and anger and rage and bitterness against them in our hearts, and forgiveness frees us to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus. Why? 
Think about what Jesus does when he forgives us. He welcomes, he welcomes us back in, doesn't he? The most powerful thing that I've ever witnessed in my life is seeing the power of forgiveness wash over someone. Let me close with this. My dad and I had a pretty intense falling out, like hardcore. He did a lot of bad things because of alcoholism. And I held on to the anger, the rage, and the bitterness toward him because of it. I was mad. In fact, I hated him for a time. I literally hated him. I would say, I hate my father. Until God got a hold of my heart and he started nudging on my heart. In his kindness and compassion, he began knocking on the hard, nasty shell of my heart to say, when are you going to let me change this? The truth is that I didn't want him to change it, right? The truth was, I think in my ignorance and rebellion, I wanted to feel it because of what he did. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to keep it. But God, because he is so good, he's relentless with his kids. You see, no stony heart can remain that way when God sets his mercy upon it. And he set his mercy upon my heart. I was listening to a podcast in my car, and it was a pastor talking about honoring your father and your mother, and I said out loud in my truck, he's not worthy of honor. And as soon as I said those words, I felt like an arrow into my heart, this like tenderness of like, I heard God's voice, and he said, neither were you, but I still went to the cross. I was devastated. How do, I, how do I rectify this? And I went back to my counselor. It took me another year, year and a half of going back to my Christian counselor and to finally come to terms with the fact that my dad wasn't the one in sin anymore, that I was. You see, what he had done was done. But what I was doing was continual every day. My anger and bitterness was poisoning my soul. So I reached out to him and I he flew to Ontario. We met at this little tiny sushi restaurant right there in Ontario. We sat across from each other in the middle of the restaurant at an open booth on both sides. I remember everything. And I sat down and I told him, I said, Dad, look, you hurt me. You've wounded me in my life. But I want you to know that God has forgiven me and he's told me that I need to forgive you. And so I forgive you. And I watched as the first wave crashed over my dad. His face changed. I said, but not only am I going to forgive you this one time, but every single time the memory comes up, I'm going to forgive you again and again and again until it's gone or until God calls me home. And he started weeping. I started crying and I watched the power of forgiveness wash over my dad. It's powerful. Maybe you're here and you've been coming, hearing the stories of people walking in their calling, thinking, man, I wish that was me. It's time for you to walk in it as well. It's time. The promises of God can't be shaken. They can't be broken. And what he promises to do and those who are obedient to him are life-changing. If you're looking at this list from today, like they're hardline black and white commands, do this and don't do that, or do this or else, you've missed the whole point. These are only possible when you have a relationship with Jesus. He says all of these things are possible. All of this is possible because he calls us to do it. If it wasn't possible, he wouldn't have told us so. It's possible for you. So will we be the sons and daughters of Christ that walk in the newness, or we choose to live in the old ways of life? Does God still forgive you? Yeah. But there is some power when we walk in the newness of Christ. There is some life change that happens on a scale that you can't even comprehend when you walk in obedience to Christ. Will you walk in obedience this morning? Lord Jesus, God, we thank you for your goodness in our life. That you give us your commands so clearly, so practically, Lord. You lay it out. It's so, it's so easy to see how to walk in the Christ, in, in Christ-like behavior for dummies. God, we thank you for your goodness, for the clarity that you bring into our lives, Lord. Help us now to walk in these ways. 
we know that it's in your word because it is possible, because you make a way, because you lead us by still waters, because your path is narrow, but you are leading us and guiding us along it. We know that it's possible because you've said, do this. So Jesus, help us as we, as we surrender ourselves. Help us to pick up our cross today and follow you. That you would continue to be kind and compassionate to us. I pray for those that are just hurting and struggling in this room right now, Lord. And there's some things in their life that they're holding on to that are, that are just keeping them at, at, at arm's length from you, Lord. You want to totally transform them.
Oh